this video we're going to start syntax, in other words, sentence structure. And we'll briefly talk about sentence structure, we'll cover grammaticality, and then we'll also cover word categories. So the first thing we'll talk about is word order. And this is something that was very briefly touched on in the introduction video. But in English, if we have the sentence James threw the ball, there's three things we can note about this sentence. First of all, the verb occurs in the middle of the sentence, the subject occurs at the beginning of the sentence, and the object occurs at the end of the sentence. And through this we can say that English word order is subject, verb, object, or SVO. Now you can imagine if there's subject, verb, and object, there's going to be six possible outcomes that you can get in a language. So you could have SVO, like English, you could have SOV, where the object comes before the verb, you could have VSO, VOS, OSV, or OVS. So there's six different possible ways that subjects, verbs, and objects can be represented in a sentence, and depending on your language, you'll have a different way of doing this. One example would be to look at something like Japanese. So here I have three sentences. The first sentence is the Japanese words. So boku wa niku o taberu. The second sentence is a direct one-to-one -one translation from Japanese into English, meaning that boku would mean I, wa is the topic marker, niku is meat, o is the object marker, and for taberu this means eat, and it means present tense. The third line that we have is the translation, so something readable in English, I eat meat. So what we can see from this is that well, Japanese has the subject at the beginning of the sentence, but then it has the object and then it has the verb. So we can say that Japanese word order is SOV. In fact, SVO and SOV are the two most common word orders across all languages. So now we can talk about grammaticality, and this is a little bit of a shift. And it's a shift in your mindset coming from something like high school into linguistics. And essentially, we talk about language statements as being either prescriptive or descriptive. Prescriptive points of view would make a judgment about language. So in other words, what should be said or written, while descriptive statements are just observations. So for instance, in high school, when you write essays and your teacher puts a lot of corrections on your page, most, most of them are prescriptive statements. Something like, oh, you should not end a sentence with a preposition. That's a prescriptive statement because we're telling you what you should do with language. However, in speech, we end sentences with prepositions all the time. So that would be a descriptive statement to say that English speakers end sentences with prepositions. That's okay. So as sort of a task, we can ask ourselves, is the statement prescriptive or descriptive? So as an example of the first one, when writing, be sure to use one instead of he or she. So I shouldn't say, he knows that blah blah blah. I should say that one knows that blah blah blah. Or you shouldn't say, you know that blah blah blah. You should say, one knows that blah 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 in an essay. So this is a prescriptive statement because if you say he or she, you're not saying anything ungrammatical. You're just not abiding to the rules of writing. And the key word that we can tell it's descriptive here is be sure to use. We're telling you what to do in writing. So this is kind of this judgment call. Consider something like number two. In Texas English, some people can say, I might could leave that on for a while. Now, if you're a Canadian English speaker or you're a speaker of English that is not in the Texas area, you're probably thinking, wait, might could? That is bad English, but in Texas English, that is perfectly okay. In their dialect, that is totally okay to say. So this is just a descriptive statement. We're not telling these speakers how to speak or what to say. We're simply making an observation about what they do in their dialect. Now, in three, some English speakers say, I ain't never done that, to mean I have never done that. And once again, this is just another descriptive statement because we're just observing what English speakers do. Now, of course, if you were to write, I ain't never done that on an essay in your high school class or in your college class, you're going to get this circled 
and you're going to get a line through it and then your teacher is going to say this is not a word or they're going to say don't use double negatives in sentences and that is a rule of writing that is a prescriptive statement however when we speak and when we observe people speak and listen to them we'll find that they produce a grammatical sentence i ain't never done that and that is acceptable to them and when you hear it you don't think wow that person doesn't speak english you think wow that person has an interesting dialect of english you might think they're lower class but you still acknowledge it as english so let's jump into lexical categories because before we talk about sentence structure and how groups and how groups of words form together we need to talk about the categories of individual words so we have things called lexical categories such as nouns, verbs, adjectives, prepositions, and adverbs. I assume if you're watching this video in English, you have roughly a good idea of what these categories are, but I'll still explain them briefly. Nouns are typically described as people, places, or things. So when you have a word like dog or gym, this is a really good description. But there are some words like happiness that are nouns, but aren't really people, places, or things. So one way you can test for nouns is you can say, can I put the word his, her, or the before it? So if you can put one of these words and you can put uh, his, her, or the before a noun, and it's good English, then it is a noun. So for instance, his happiness is acceptable. His dog is acceptable. But compare it to something like his quick. You can't just say his quick, so quick can't be a noun. Or his die, that doesn't make any sense where die is a verb there. Okay, verbs are actions, such as run, die, throw. Adjectives describe nouns, so happy dog, quick dog, slow dog. Prepositions are usually locations, so before, or under, or over. But there's also these other prepositions like of or with, like I went to school with my friend, where with is a preposition or something in like of, like in map of Canada, of being a preposition. And finally, in the last of the lexical categories, there are adverbs. So these modify verbs, like I happily ran the marathon, I quickly ran the marathon, I will die shortly, something very sad like that. Okay, then we have these functional categories. And there is a difference between lexical and functional categories, which we'll talk about when we finally build tree structures, but functional categories usually pattern with one of the lexical categories. So for instance, determiners like the, uh, or these, determiners pattern with nouns, so you'll always see them with nouns when they occur. Qualifiers are words that can modify uh, adverbs, such as very quickly, or even prepositions, such as into. You can say more into it, or he's so into it. Auxiliaries are modals or words like have or being. For instance, I could have been happy, could have been, these are all auxiliaries. Or I have went to the store. That word have is an auxiliary. It's kind of a supporting verb for the main verb. Finally, conjunctions, these join two sentences together, essentially. So I went to the store and I went to the park. I love coffee, but I don't drink it often. Something like that. So now that we know lexical categories, you can pause the video and try to assign all of these words, these lexical categories. Uh, let's just get right into it. So I, I is a noun. I would like cereal for breakfast. So would is a modal word, but we'll just call this an ox. I would like cereal for breakfast. So like, I would like cereal for breakfast. So this is kind of tricky. This is a verb. So I would like cereal for breakfast. Uh, we need a verb in a sentence. A sentence is not complete without some type of verb. And would is a modal. It is not going to be the main verb of your sentence. Cereal is a noun. For is a preposition. And breakfast is also a preposition. Okay, two, the balloon could have popped. The balloon. Well, balloon is our noun. And remember when I said determiners pair with nouns? Well, the is a determiner, and it's occurring right before the noun here. The balloon could have popped. So could 
is another modal word. It's an auxiliary. Have is another one of those supporting verbs. And popped is finally our main verb of the sentence in the past tense. So you can say the balloon popped. The balloon could have popped. The balloon had popped. Again, you can see these words like could and have are all just kind of supporting that main verb. Finally, Jim ran very quickly to a store. Well, Jim is a noun. It's a proper name. We usually just label all proper names as nouns. Ran is a verb. Then we have very quickly to a store. Okay, well, think about quickly. Quickly is talking about how the running was done. So quickly is an adverb. Now, what is very doing? Well, very is kind of telling us how quickly, right? Is it a little quickly or very quickly? So this is our qualifier. And we'll see that qualifiers and adverbs pair together quite often. So Jim ran very quickly to a store. So to is a preposition, a uh, is a determiner, and finally store is a noun. So this is word category identification, and this is something you pick up with quite a bit of practice. You can take pretty much any sentence that you can speak, and you can try to assign categories to these words. So if you'd like in the comments below, you can always just give a sentence, write the categories, and I can tell you if you are missing anything or if you've made a mistake. Okay, so the last important point of this video that I want to point out is that words can group into phrases. And this is what I mentioned before, but we can talk about it a little bit more formally. So all of our lexical categories, like nouns, verbs, adjectives, prepositions, and adverbs, build up into things called phrases. And this is represented by the P here. So for instance, this first one we have here, this is a noun phrase. And the noun phrase consists of a determiner and a noun. So if we have the dog, well, this is a unit. This is maybe a subject of our sentence. So it should be treated as a group. And in the next video, when we cover constituency tests, we'll figure out how to find these groups. But the dog, this patterns together. So these build up into noun phrases. Quickly run, well, verb phrases will break into adverbs and verbs. Adjective phrases, so if you have happy, you can modify it with a qualifier, like so happy. With a preposition like into, we can say right into. So this prepositional phrase will break into a qualifier and a preposition. What's important to note is that when we build these structures, if we have a verb, then it better build into a verb phrase. So we don't necessarily need these functional categories in our phrases. So we could have a noun phrase that just consists of the noun, let's say Jim, in a proper name. We don't need a determiner with it. Or if we have run, like if I want to say he runs, well, this would be a verb phrase with just the word runs. We don't need quickly. Quickly is optional. Same with something like happier into. We don't need to say right into. We might just have, let's say, a word that ends with a preposition like with. Uh, a tree like this with just a PP and a P is incredibly rare. But uh, the point being that we don't necessarily need these what we'll call specifiers on the left or these functional categories in our phrases. So if you have any questions about this video, please leave them in the comments below and I'll get to them as quickly as I can.